Good morning. You're listening to the Blaine's World Show, heard each Wednesday here on WPVM FM 103.7 in Asheville, North Carolina. You can also listen online at WPVM.org and watch on WPVM's Facebook page. I'm your host, Blaine Greenfield, in my Zoom studio in Fairview, North Carolina. And each week we focus on the Asheville theater scene, as well as positive news and information about people and organizations in both Western North Carolina and throughout the country. And to that end, it's my pleasure to introduce um, somebody I've tried to have on the guest for quite some time, and he is Franklin Keel. Welcome aboard, Franklin. Hi, thank you. Okay, and Franklin, and he just did already, I was going to say you wave to all your fans and friends on Facebook, you beat me to it. Um, <laughs> Franklin Keel has his uh, BM from Eastman School of Music, is an associate um, principal celloist with the Asheville Symphony Orchestra, founding cellist of the Opal String Quartet, and cello, cello singer, songwriter for Upland Drive and Cirrus B. He has appeared as a soloist with the Asheville Symphony, the Henderson Seminole Symphony, the Brevard Philharmonic, and the Blue Blue Ridge Orchestra. And he composes original music for, for the Rarely Theater. He teaches and performs in Western North Carolina. And I should mention, Franklin, that I've had the pleasure to um, listen to you a bunch of times. And it's always a real pleasure. Thank and um, the first question I'd like to ask you is, you, you grew up where? I grew up in, in Fairview, actually. Oh, did you really? Okay. I was born in, in Concord, North Carolina, not far from Charlotte. Um, and we moved to uh, Fairview when I was starting sixth grade. Do you still and live in Fairview? I, I do. Oh, okay. I saw the, hey, neighbor. It's, yeah. <laughs> uh, I have to bump into you sometime. Let me ask you this question. When you were a little kid then, did you always know you wanted to be a, a cello player? No, I think probably right up until the time I was about maybe 16, I probably would have laughed at you if you told me I was going to be a, a professional cellist. Um, I, I think I've loved music as long as I can remember. Um, my parents tell me that they used to use a record player to help me fall asleep because um, I used to keep them up at night. Um, and then one night they woke up and I was crying and I had pulled myself up and turned on the record player before they had decided whose turn it was to come and wake me up. And um, that, that record player I definitely remember as an older child, um, you know, listening to Def Leppard and Dire Straits and Michael Jackson and... Um, and I started uh, on the violin pretty early. Um, that story is another one that my parents tell me because I don't remember <laughs> that well. Right. But I had a babysitter who played the violin and she came and played for my birthday. And I started asking them if I could start playing the violin. Um, and I didn't really like it that much. When I finally got one into my hands, um, you know, I had a, they, they had first, because I was too young, I, I was like two years old and they couldn't find a teacher that would teach me. So like they gave me this box with a ruler tape to it so I could practice rest position and playing position. And I had a little stick for my bow and I would play along to these um, Suzuki method records. And so when I got a real violin in my hands, probably, you know, six, seven months later, um, you know, I just, it, it just made all these scratchy, horrible sounds. <laughs> I handed it back to her and I said, I want a different one. This one's broken. And um, I had a pretty rocky relationship with the violin after that because it wasn't something that I could just play. And um, I also didn't really want to practice as a little kid either. Um, but they, you know, my parents were, you know, they were good parents. They were like, well, you know, you begged us for this, so <laughs> we're going to practice. Um, and then, you know, after a while, if you still don't like it, you can quit. Um, and when I was six years old, I got to my lesson a little bit early and the teacher was working with a cellist and it must have been what it was like seeing the violin for the first time, because I remember this part. I started asking my parents if I could keep switch to the cello. Maybe it was because it seemed a little bit better than the violin, um, and, or maybe it was just a nice change. The tone was, I remember the tone being really cool. And um, I still had a pretty rocky relationship with it until I was about in high school and um, discovered the music of Antonio Vivaldi. 
and things started really going downhill from there. I started like looking for music to play by Vivaldi and found the Bach cello suites and there it went. What was the first uh, concert you ever performed in? Do you remember? The first, I mean, aside from those like Suzuki recitals, right. um, you know, there were string orchestra concerts, you know, that started around seventh grade when I started taking in the schools. The first one I really remember was my uh, first performance of a full symphony at the Brevard Music Center. We played Tchaikovsky's Fourth Symphony. Um, this has not happened before or since. The audience was clapping before we finished. You know, like the, the, the ending is just sort of ramping up and it's getting more and more and more exciting. We're like, boom, 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 boom. And the drums start rolling and you can already hear the applause as we're playing our last three notes. And um, I remember making a decision that I wanted to be a professional musician at the end of that symphony. How like we were standing were up and being recognized and the conductor was taking his bow and I was like, man, I can do this. <laughs> How old were you? <laughs> Um, I was 17. Because the idea I have, Franklin, I have this idea. I want to do a fundraiser for one of the local theaters and everybody would do their first performance, you know? Um, so it even be before the 17 year age, you know, you have to think about when you were six or seven or something, back. but wouldn't that be cool that everybody would get up because most of the time, I don't know if your folks had videotaped it. Most of the time people don't have a record of it, you know? very first, even that right. the concert you mentioned at 17, wouldn't it be cool if there was a record of it, you know, a performance of it? So back in my mind, I want to do that. Everybody give everybody a chance to have their first performance. So at 17, that's cool that you realized you wanted to be a professional musician. You then went to study. So you then went on to study that for that reason? Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was already pretty well in the thick of it by then. Um, but I, I did decide that that I wanted to pursue it as a career and started having more serious conversations with my teacher about finding a school to audition for. And the one you went to is certainly one of the, be one of the best, if not the best in the country. I was really fortunate. I had a, I had a great teacher. I was, um, you know, lucky in, in that I performed well at those particular auditions. Um, I auditioned for eight schools and got into three. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty decent batting average for me. I don't know how it is for a lot of other people who play at conservatories, but they, it's, it's a tricky process. So then you went to school and then you eventually graduated. And at that point in time, you were a professional musician or what was the transition? So, um, I had taken pay gigs in college, um, you know, with community orchestras around the area and weddings or dinners or whatever. Um, and I started teaching lessons, private lessons, almost immediately when I returned from school. Um, I um, auditioned, re-auditioned for the Asheville Symphony and resumed my post as a member of the cello section. Um, and was there for the um, search and hiring of both Daniel Meyer and Darko Buderich. And um, wasn't really sure where I was gonna land. I wasn't sure if I was gonna stay in Asheville or not. And one thing I really enjoyed, or several things I really enjoyed. One was making music in the mountains. There's something about being here that is really fulfilling to me as an artist. Um, and the other is the variety. Like I do a little bit of chamber music, a little bit of orchestra music. I play in a band, I can write my own stuff. And, you know, my, my work has sort of become this sort of cobbling together of all these different things. And that variety has really sort of kept me going this whole time. Um, yeah. I was going to ask you, so out of all the things you do, do you have a favorite thing? And so I'm hearing you, you teach, you perform, you write, playing bands. Do you have I, a favorite I thing? Don't. I think that if I if I had a favorite thing, I would probably dive headfirst into <laughs> that. Um, but I mean, I don't think I, there's any one of those things that I would want to give up. I have a sort of, you know, there's there's something very specific about each one of those things that's very gratifying to me as a person and as a musician. Um, 
you know, the grandeur of the orchestra and the, the infinite access to color that it has, um, the intimacy of chamber music and digging into some of the best works that composers have ever written. Um, and then, you know, trying my hand at making my own creations, you know, like it's, it's all, I think it's all part of what sort of keeps things interesting. I think if I was doing the same thing all the time that I would probably get sick of it. How about something else you mentioned, I will call it the P word, practice. Um, do you still practice? All the time. How much, how long do you practice? Um, as a gigging musician, you know, when I'm, when I'm working, um, there's, there's a, there's an, a finite amount of time that I can play each day. Um, and when rehearsals are like, you know, two and a half hours, and if there's a double, then I may not practice very much that day at all. Um, but, you know, during the pandemic, it was like maybe five, four or five hours a day. Is it really? Wow. Um, and more if I could find the time. Um, but as it, you know, when, when things start to get busy, it's harder to find it and find that kind of time. And some days I'll be able to put that much time in, but others it's more like two hours. If I'm lucky three. It's interesting. So just curious. So you practice. So what are you practicing? Um, so I will usually start uh, playing open strings, you know, Nothing with the fingerboard. Let me get my, where's my bow? You know, just the, the strings by, by themselves. And I'll, um, you know, I'll get to know my arm. I'll play in different, different parts of the string. Um, try different bow exercises. You know, just, just different combinations of rhythms and whatever sort of helps me get to know my right side a little bit better. Um, and then I do the same thing with the left side. I try to get things organized. One thing that I do is like practice vibrato, like really wide, even this wide. <laughs> um, and, you know, just do things that'll sort of help me sort of loosen up my hands and just practice kind of the act of playing the cello that's sort of separate from playing music um and then after my body feels really good my mind feels organized then i'll start to dive into some of the music that i'm working on how, uh, how many cellos do you have i have three cellos um this is igor uh, <laughs> i've had igor since 2017 he was made in 2016 he's a little baby um and he's my he's my main axe um, I have a cello that I got my senior year in high school. My grandmother got me uh, this cello uh, for a graduation present, and his name is Johannes. And Johannes was made in 1998 in Fairview, North Carolina by David Rhodes. And um, Johannes is currently in the hands of one of my colleagues, and he's letting me use a carbon fiber instrument that he plays um that i can play outside in un, you know and not have to worry about shade or anything like that and so that cello is unnamed um and so right now he has johannes and i have uh, the unnamed carbon fiber cello and then um, my electric cello is named jimmy and jimmy is a ned steinberger model and it's fantastic i can hook him up to all sorts of funny boxes and sound like a guitar or a piano or whatever that's funny you said that because that's why i asked you off the air that i had seen you in concert one time with the electric cello and then you know it threw me a little bit because i was wondering how you're getting those sounds and you know it, looked, it looks a little bit different too right Yes, it does. It's basically the same measurements as a cello, um, but the body's missing because it's pretty unnecessary. The body is sort of the cello's sounding board. Like this is just an echo box. Gotcha. So it's basically just the fingerboard and a little bit of wood here to support the bridge. And it basically just sort of stops here. And um, I have a little um, shoulder strap contraption that I use to keep it so I can play standing up. Because that's why I saw you. I saw you play standing up. I said, whoa, that was different. And while you have Igor there, by the way, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot. But could you uh, maybe play, I'll let you choose it, um, 
one one of your, your things you, you perform? Sure. Um, I'll play the uh, the prelude to the box box second suite in D minor. Go for it. music do you know like well, you have memorized i mean i'm incredible that you did that whole thing and you weren't playing it and you weren't reading the music well i i have been playing most of the cello suite since i was about 15 so that's been a long journey um but i mean a lot of the a lot of the repertoire is is as has been, I guess, most of the stuff that I've worked on for a couple of months, I usually have it memorized by then. And I might have forgotten a lot of it now, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard not to memorize something that you investigate and practice thoroughly, you know. It's the nice thing about that, though. Even if you have gotten something, I wouldn't have known. <laughs> you know, so yeah. <laughs> you, know, 
but you would know, I, I guess, too. Again, one of the, the, the amazing things about you, Franklin, too, which I really admire, is you play so many different kinds of music, you know. Um, same question I asked you before in terms of um, you have a favorite thing you do. Do you have a favorite kind of music you, you like? Not really. I go in and out of different things. Um, you know, I, I've had artist obsessions before, um, you know, Tool, Pink Floyd, The Beatles, The Roots, Modest Mouse, um, a slew of classical composers from Bach to Brahms to Vivaldi to Tchaikovsky, uh, Prokofiev, um, you know, and I, you know, especially if I get into something like I can, I can sort of fixate on it for a while. You know, like I think I listened to the the Rite of Spring for probably three weeks straight at one point, um, and just didn't really listen to much else. Um, and then eventually I'll sort of move on and come back to it later. You know, one of the exciting things also, Franklin, that you're involved in now is that things are starting to open up. So already you were telling me that you have a pretty active schedule for the next couple of months, at least what's coming up. Um, okay. So on June the 20th, I am playing the Haydn concerto in C major with the Blue Ridge orchestra. Um, and that'll be at the market street, D Diana Wortham's, uh, courtyard uh, oh, nice. through market market street. And there's two performances of that one at three 30 and one at five 30. Um, and then on July 2nd, I'm playing with uh, an 80s cover band called Laser Lover. This is our first show ever. Um, Eric Congdon, Raphael Morales, Sam Frame, Walker Aston, and Brad Kurdioff are all members of this band. And um, it's uh, just a, a tribute to some of the best music of the 80s. <laughs> Very Covered cool. By the, quite a range. Um, the next day, my original music project will be at the White Horse in Black Mountain. We'll be doing a live stream from there on July 3rd. Um, and that's also open to the public for um, for live seating. Um, and we usually do a little bit of extra music at the end for our live audience members too. So it'll be worth coming to see. And um, that'll just be your music. Will you be with anybody else? There um, that, that's my, my, my music and uh, our a band. Um, so it's guitar, bass, drums, cello, keyboard. That's that's all of the instruments. And uh, what's the name I of the band? I'm be singing. It's Upland Drive. Okay. And um, we 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 cover a lot of music too, but it's mostly an original music project. So um, it's sort of the place that the songs that I write that I, I it was born because I had a whole bunch of songs that I wrote for other bands that didn't quite make it. And you know, they're like, oh, this is a great song, but we're not going to play it. Um, it doesn't really fit what we do. <laughs> and so eventually I'd written enough music to just put my own project together. It sort of became a home for all that stuff. So that'd be a white horse. Very exciting. I yeah. think you said you had one other thing coming up in what was it, um, September? So August 6th is the next one. My band Sirius B will be at the Funkatorium for Menage a Freak. And then on September 11th, I'm playing the Elgar Concerto in E minor with the Blue Ridge Orchestra. Well, it certainly doesn't sound like you're going to get bored by doing any of this stuff. I mean, this is really quite a range of stuff it, yeah, you're doing. Yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all over the place. Um, but that's fun. I, I love it. I love everything about that. <laughs> well, remaining time, let me put you on the spot once again. How about if, if you have something handy, an original thing uh, that you could perform and tell us what it is? Yeah, this song is, uh, this is the first one that I wrote. It was inspired by a line that Anne-Marie Combs gave us when we were doing our Series B Kickstarter. Um, the line that she gave us was, uh, the sun will shine after every storm. And um, we, uh, this, this song sort of came from that, it's called Cabin Fever. I don't belong in this town I don't belong in this town 
this town And though my feet regularly leave the ground I know I'll see you around My clothes are tattered and torn My body battered and worn And although the sun will shine after every storm I've been here since the day I was born I don't belong in this town I don't belong in this town And though my feet regularly leave the ground I know I'll see day job, a shameless heart, and nothing to lift the weight off, all these years in lucid hallucinations, say she ate my fears, spending the rest of my days here. Sage advice I did not heed From my ears, nose, and mouth I will bleed And I turn my back on everything I need Drowned in hopeful words and empty deeds I don't belong in this town I don't belong in this town And though my feet regularly leave the ground I guess I'll see Wow, did I love that? Great Thanks. sound. I, you know, you mentioned that you wrote the song. How many songs have you written, Ballpark? Um, let's see. Probably about six or seven for Upland Drive. Um, at least a couple of sections of songs for Series B. Um, we all just sort of write things together. It's a whole, like everybody's sort of involved in this sort of creative soup. Um, I've written a piece for a uh, double string quartet. Um, and that's uh, hopefully gonna become a, a five movement work. I've got two movements completed and themes for um, two other movements um, in the works. Very cool. Uh, that, that last song was just incredible. And frankly, as we wind down here, let me just ask you if folks want to get in touch with you or find out more about what you're doing, where you're going to be performing, what's the best bet? Probably Facebook right now. Um, my, uh, I, I probably am going to be paying attention to this, this marketing thing coming right, exactly up. Yes. I, yeah. I have a lot to learn about all that kind of thing. Um, but, um, yeah, reaching out to me on Facebook is probably the best bet. Um, Sirius B also has a, a website, www.seriousbmusic.com. And um, that's, a, that's a good way to find out what that project is doing. Um, and I look forward to 
sort of learning more about engaging the audience as as things start to to build a little bit. Well, it's a compliment to you. You certainly do it. So I want to thank you for being my guest this first half hour on the Blaine's World Show. And as I say goodbye to you, I'm going to do the magic of technology here. I'm going to see if I can make you disappear. And hopefully okay. I'll see you in person real soon. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Okay, that was great. Okay. And as our second guest works his way into the studio, let me see if I can find him. Um, I think he's going to be joining us in a second. I'll be with you in just a second, PJ. I should mention that uh, WPBM's mission is to foster a community through programming that cultivates dialogue to inform and attain. The station provides the medium for artists, businesses, community leaders, and nonprofits to share the voice on live radio. Listeners are invited to help support WPVM's efforts by making a tax-deductible contribution. You can do so by going to the website, wpvmfm.org, and looking at the donate option on the upper right-hand side. My second guest is uh, PJ Ewing, who is the founder of C and CMO of Jeep Walking uh, Outsource. And you can... Um, Say hello to all your fans and friends in Facebook world, PJ. Hello, everyone. Blaine, thank you. It's so nice to see your face here. Well, Love it. Likewise. Mm -hmm. And mention that um, PJ, I've gotten to know, know through his work with uh, WPVM, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Yeah. But PJ is a graduate of the University of Michigan and Notre Dame, where he got his MBA. He's an ad guy from Leo Burnett, pretty good credential. Right. Built a division of Screen Vision to help sell the company. PJ is the CMO of X10 Therapy and has a digital marketing consultation business called CMO, Chief Marketing Outsource. PJ lives with his wife and three kids in Lower Manhattan. PJ is host of TNF. I love that. Less to the nightly on radio stations across the nation, including WPVM. Before we go anywhere else, I have to ask you, I've always wondered the significance of less to the nightly. Wait to get that Lester name. the Nightfly, Nightfly 1982. Yeah, yeah. 1982, Donald Fagan from Seely Dan uh, came out with a song. I was in college at Michigan and we were upstairs in the fraternity rooms and there was this new record. And one of the songs, in fact, this record was so great, The Nightfly by Donald Fagan, that I named my oldest Maxine after one of the songs from the record. And I also fell in love with the image on the cover, which was uh, this live Donald Fagan with uh, smoking a cigarette with a big microphone blaine and he's got uh, a mug he's smoking Chesterfield Kings and he's up all night talking to crazy people over the radio and I just imagined what was life like for a guy who would do the late shift and talk to people and play his jazz the, the lyric says uh, uh, jazz and conversation uh, until the sun comes through the skyline. And I'm like, I want to be Lester. So finally, Veen, Dial, and WPVM let PJ become Lester. <laughs> that's why I, I have the show on the station, and now it's in some others as well. And that's Lester the Nightfly. It's great fun, great fun. But it's love the name for a show. You know, Isn't it yeah. the best? I mean, you know, because it's it, there's so much behind it. And, you know, the idea of having a conversation and talking about music and letting music be the window to one's life and their soul. And, you know, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but that's that's kind of what I do with the show. Now, you grew up, what, in Michigan? Yeah, Michigan, uh, suburban uh, Detroit, fr uh, Farmington Hills is the name of the town. I went to uh, Catholic Central High School and then the University of Michigan, then Notre Dame, all in succession. I don't think I was ready to face the real world, Blaine. So I wanted more school. <laughs> well, when you were a kid growing up, did you always know you wanted to be? Well, first of all, it's, you have an interesting career tra tra trajectory. Did mm -hmm. you first of all know you wanted to be in advertising? I thought of that from the pretty early days, did although you I... Uh, yeah, I did. You know, I was uh, I wanted to be uh, first. I was thinking about music and in some fashion. My family's very musical. My sister's a Broadway actress and my other sister is a filmmaker. And my mom is a singer. My dad, a piano person. We've all been very into opera. So there's a lot of culture there. And I thought music might be a path for me. But then I kind of moderated that to advertising. And then I got into advertising uh, and then sales and sort of that world of marketing. But yeah, it was. Um, well, from the beginning, I think I was interested in the media and communication, at least. And so what was your first advertising job? Uh, 
It was Leo Burnett. I, I, I literally um, went to Notre Dame and then I had an internship in the summer at Leo Burnett and then they hired me for the following year. I was there for four years and then that began a, a, you know, a series of marketing and advertising positions kind of growing up from big companies to small companies. I was doing work for Pepsi for a while and at their agency here in the New York area. And uh, but then I went into a lot of small companies. I ended up working in a lot of non-traditional media, Blaine, where you know there's place-based media and whole a whole bunch of places to put screens where you can communicate. And that became you know my my career path really. And you mentioned, for example, or in the introduction, you were with Screen Vision. And what, what was yeah, Screen Vision about? Yeah, Screen Vision, fabulous company, and it's still alive today. Believe it or not, Blaine, barely but alive, and I still have friends there. This is the advertising before the movies start. And when we started this company, and I, I didn't start it, I, was, I joined you know, five, six years in, but it was a small concern and it was, you know, they're gonna throw tomatoes at the screens and you know, <laughs> nobody wants advertising. And... My, my, my reaction too, it was. Yeah. <laughs> right, you know, who, who, who whoa, it's a one sacred place, you can't put commercials. <laughs> Well, it's become a huge business and um, that was decimated in the last 12 months, but now it's starting to come back. The skeletal crew is becoming more and more of a real concern. I have a tremendous number of friends from that organization, but what we were, I was able to do was create a very lucrative division that wasn't advertising. It was actually the promotions. So when you see a popcorn bag and there's advertising on it or signage or promotions, you're handed gum or whatever the heck it is. I created that out of nothing. And I ended up having quite a number of people on operations and sales. And it was a lot of fun. We, we made a lot of money, but we also were putting money into the theaters. We had our, our portion and it contributed to the, the overall health of the company, Screen Vision, to the point where we were able to sell it for a lot of money. And you know, we really doubled, tripled, quadrupled this, the value of Screen Vision and it was sold to big, big, big organizations. I did, I departed after that. I thought my kind of my challenges were done and I went off to some other smaller companies to do the same thing, which I did, which I did. And then you got into, and that's how I kind of know you, you also then got into digital marketing. And, and yeah, I mean, I, I ended up into that. Well, it's funny because, you know, uh, the family was calling in some ways, and that is a family business. And it's a knee surgery recovery product called the X10. And the website is X10 Therapy. And this was an invention of my father's. And we spent a lot of money. But we ended up building a machine that helps you recover from knee surgery brilliantly, quickly, at home, without the trappings of physical therapy and, you know, big innovation. And as a very tiny first idea, then company, we needed websites and communication and digital marketing. And so over the course of five, six, seven years, I didn't go to school to learn digital marketing, Blaine. I did it for the company. And you learned the family business, right? You learned the, the, the good things, the dumb things, the wasting of money and the, all the, the things that you do to build a brand, which we did. And it's incredibly successful. And our presence on YouTube and our presence in the digital world is astounding for a, you know, an effort that didn't have any money spent behind it. We've never advertised the company. It was all through organic digital marketing. And that means we wrote a lot of blogs. We did a lot of video. I edited videos all the time. We did a whole bunch of podcasting, which I, I continue to do. And all of that effort built a presence, um, a crude, a mass of communication on YouTube and all the other channels, where now if you look up certain things that we want you to look up on the internet, you're up late at night and you can't bend your knee and you're really mad at the world, ding, 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 X10 therapy pops up for those conditions that you're looking for solutions for. And, and that's so what I learned. And then I sort of, I've, I've been helping others and with my own little side business to help them do that same kind of thing for their businesses really. And I so appreciate you telling the story because for the life of me, I was trying to figure out what was the connection right. with you and knee surgery. And knees, you know, my right? God, like, of all things. Exactly. You would never believe it, Blaine. I am a communicating <laughs> person. I love uh, the doing the work that I do, but I'll tell you the 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 gratification, the the, the good feeling of helping people with their knees uh, when they're in trouble. You won't believe it, but when you have a knee replacement, you have all these hopes pinned on sure. success, and when it doesn't go right, you are not happy, and you are literally uh, that scenario that I mentioned. The it's three in the morning, I can't bend my knee, I'm in pain. 
That is exactly what happens. And I get all of the leads. I get probably 15 to 20 different inquiries every day. And many of them are at three in the morning when they're like, can you help me? I'm in Idaho. I'm in California. I got a problem and I am desperate. I saw you on YouTube. Are you real? Is it a real company? Do you guys really, you know, is this YouTube magic or is this something for real? And they end up getting on the phone with me or one of our representatives and nah, not always, but oftentimes we are the answer. And if we're not the immediate answer, we will be part of the solution to fixing that problem and getting, writing the ship. Because really, you know, you're 65, you had a knee replaced or two, and you're like, okay, my last third act of my life is going to be full of no pain and, and, and act, action and activity. And then suddenly, you, you know, this big hope, this knee replacement surgery isn't going well. That is not a happy person. And I, and I end up getting on the phone with them and it's a joy. I, I, you know, I never would have expected Blaine in my life that I would love so much helping people fix these problems and the love that comes back, the sense of family we have with these patients, the, the, the word of mouth, the fact that we help them and when all else was kind of lost, it, it's a, I never would have guessed this in my life. You look at me, right? You see advertising and Madison Avenue kind of stuff and Pepsis and McDonald's and all that fancy stuff. And yet in the end, the most satisfying job has really been helping one by one individuals with this, this curious difficulty in recover. recover. Well, one of the things I think that's cool about you, PJ, also. There are a lot of things fact, that are cool. Well, about but, it, but one of them <laughs> is that how I'm even speaking to you and how I got to know you. And we'll talk about that in a second, <laughs> okay. but it's incredible that you're doing this out of your place in New York, right? I am in my place in New York right now. Uh, you know, it, it's a madness in lower Manhattan. I have a wife running a beautiful CPA practice. I've got uh, two of my three children. The, the, the oldest is just a graduate of Carnegie Mellon and off mm -hmm. to the world. But the two little ones are in the other room trying to be quiet so that I can do this. I do the digital marketing with my MacBook Pro. It's uh, the lights are on all the time. My wife will go back to her office. I will do the same, but we're just at the, obviously the end of this pandemic. And, and I am, um, I'm anxious for the quiet to sort of come back. Kids went to school three weeks ago. My God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So that, you know, we're not literally going to school and conducting business at the same time, but yeah, we're, we're, you know, I'm in lower Manhattan, um, wall street area, and we're really getting our act together. Things are starting to feel pretty normal, um, not normal, normal, but, you know, Broadway, the opera, the arts won't be here till September, which I can't wait for. But in terms of restaurants, we're back at full capacity. So, yeah, it's, I, but I am doing it. You know, honestly, if you know what you're doing and you, you've had your hard knocks like I have in digital marketing, you need a MacBook Pro and, and an Internet connection and maybe a good microphone, maybe a good camera. You're in business. I mean, you, you just got to know what you're doing. You know, you said something interesting, too, that. You said, so everything's getting back to normal. And you actually have an office in an office, not, not where you are now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I, uh, my wife does as well. And I, you know, it's healthy to get out of your, I have gained weight. I've, I've, I've like, the world is a weird place now until I get <laughs> out walking to the, the office and the, you know, it's, it's not going to be the way it should be. And so I'm, I, we're really literally emerging in the last month, last three weeks, we're emerging from this cocoon that we've been in. So. And your story is also an interesting one in terms of how I even got to know you or how I got to met you, meet yeah. you. And I got to meet you and I'd like to find out more about that through the radio station WPVM. And all of a sudden I meet this guy, PJ on the phone or however we met. Mm. And I'm thinking to me, well, you're downtown Asheville, you know, I'll, uh, I'll meet you, we'll get together for lunch. Right. Remember I said, I want to yeah, do something that. with you. I said, no, I can't. I mean, you can't. I'm in New York. But I couldn't believe it because you felt like you were in Asheville. And that's, talk about uh, that, that process. How, how do you even find WPVM, for example? And for all your viewers and listeners, who sounds like the New Yorker? Blaine? <laughs> Mich Mich Michigan Midwest. I don't sound like a New Yorker. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's funny. Through one of our co-hosts, James Nave. Right. Um, an old friend. Worked with James. I call him Nave. That's what we right. have yeah, for yeah, years and years. Yeah. So Nave, who hosts Twice Five Miles on, on WPVM, we 
uh, stayed in touch and became friends over the course of 30 years. We worked together at Pepsi doing ideations and brainstorming and creating new products and stuff like that. And we were just shooting the breeze after, you know, a little bit of a hiatus. And he said, Davine Dial and WPVM, and I have a radio show. And boy, if you'd ever like me to introduce you, PJ. And, and I thought, oh, that's ha ha ha. And then and I paused, Blaine. I said, wait a minute. Did you just say I could maybe have a radio show? <laughs> Lester the Nightfly flowing into my brain, the picture of Donald Fagan on the album cover. And, you know, within a couple of weeks, we navigated our way with a beautiful call with Davine, who's the most awesome person who's the founder of The Feast, who's made this all happen for all of us on WPVM. Um, we found a way to for me to try it. And I can't tell you, this is six months ago, seven months ago, how nervous, how, oh, I'm not ready. And I'll let you know when I can put a show together. Like I, I have the, the chops to do it. I have the gear. I have the know-how. I've been doing podcasts forever. And But boy, was I nervous about that first show, trying to make it perfect because the radio is so much more than a podcast. It's it's uh, reaches many people at once. It's uh, it's got so much. It, it's just like we, we all think of podcasts and people want to say, oh, you've got a podcast, PG. And I'm quick to distinguish the, that. It, no, it's, it is. You can listen to it later. You can you can have, um, uh, you know, a repeat listen. But radio is a magical, wonderful thing that's been part of our culture for a very long time. And it was very nerve wracking to be able to you know have a show. And since I've done that, I think I've done 23, 24 shows at this point weekly, Lester the Night Flight. It's at 7 p.m. On, on WPVM on Thursdays. But now it's also through Davine's help um, on the PRX network, the Pacifica Radio Network. It's reaching into eight, nine, 10 different stations. It's on some international global radio stations. It, it's really finding its legs a little bit. It's never going to be that important. It's, it's a very eclectic uh, follow my nose kind of thing. So I don't expect it'll ever amount to that much, but it's mine and it's a joy to make. And that's how you ended up seeing my face or hearing my voice is really through Nave and Davine, really. Had you ever done radio before? No, no, but I guess, you know, again, this is right back to, to uh, X10 therapy and the family business. What did I do? Uh, uh, we were running out of gas, just making videos, making sure. testimonial videos. And I just think, didn't think we had it in us. We were just getting tired of, of constantly cranking out interviews with patients. And I, I felt also that a, a minute and a half version of a 45 minute interview isn't fair. And I thought that a podcast would be a solution for that because it's unvarnished, Blaine. It's truthful. There's no smoke and mirrors. There's no editing. It's a conversation with somebody and they're gonna tell you the truth. And when I, I, I found that a 45 minute version of an interview sometimes really is the right thing to do, I started getting good at production using the tools on the MacBook Pro, the good mics and figuring out how to, how to get it all done. And I started producing beautiful podcasts. It's called the Bees Knees Podcast. It's about knee surgery recovery. I'm sure nobody's gonna wanna listen to it unless <laughs> you're, you really need to. But when you really need to, you find it on Apple and all the places. And so the podcast, uh, I learned how to produce on the podcast. And so technically I could do the radio. It was just, you, I mean, you, you, it was embarrassing. You should see me in the, in the, the kids room in lower Manhattan at five, you know, midnight, get my voice to do the right thing. I mean, no, it was, it was really, you know, not embarrassing as I guess you have to go through it, but it was very amateur hour for a while until I sort of got, got a sense of how to do it and put it together. And then, you you know, Blaine, like, just like you, you've done such a beautiful thing with this show, you know, well, what is the tonality? What is the vibe? What are the questions that you want to ask? Who, what guests do you want to bring in? Great cellists or old marketing guys like me, you know, <laughs> well, you know, it, it, you have to sort of, once you know how to do it, well, what are you, what do you want to do? What is the, the sensibility? And I have to be honest with Lester, the Nightfly, I'm still figuring it out and I don't think I'll ever figure it out. One week it's PJ playing his music. One week it's an interview or two weeks with a, a musician, an artist. Other times it's a friend who's got a certain style of music that they really like. Um, I'm really open to different formats and different pursuits, knowing that hopefully, I hope, you know, each week is an experience. Uh, lately I've been creating soundscapes to kind of support the conversation. I did one 
a few weeks ago with a, a gentleman named Cork Burroughs, and he was talking about race in Alabama and uh, you know, buying that first record that would be a James Brown, a, a record that wasn't something that a white kid should buy, and what what it was like to have his eyes opened by radio and WLS in Chicago, and how his world changed by the music that he purchased. It was a great episode. I had no idea. I thought we were just going to play a bunch of music that Cork liked, and then talk a little bit about introducing them. It turned into a deep dive into three or four tracks, but really Alabama race. Uh, a whole world that I didn't expect. And, and it was one of my favorite episodes. So you never know where it's going to lead you, really. And that kind of ties into one of the things that, that always impressed me about you, PJ, mm-hmm. is that you seem to be able to pick up a lot of different stuff, you know, I guess as you need it. And the cool thing is, like, you never went to school for any of this stuff. You just mm-hmm. kind of learned it on your own. Yeah. I mean, right. Uh, what did I find out? I, I, I listened to our watch. I actually listened to Brian Williams on the podcast version of MSNBC you know, yeah. pretty much every day. He said the other day, I never went to college. I'm like, Brian Williams? Interesting. Never went to co- How, right? I mean, the most well-spoken, put together, <laughs> like right. Brian Williams, my goodness, you know. And, you know, I mean, my daughter just, we just spent a lot of money on my daughter to go to Carnegie Mellon and she got a science degree and that's great. And I'm sure it'll serve her well. But you look at the the big successes out there. I don't know if they credit the university and and the education for the specific discipline uh, to the, with their success. I, I think that you follow it, you learn what you need to learn as you go. Um, digital marketing is a pursuit uh, that a lot of people can adopt if they kind of get the right learning. And you can just grunt work, learn how to build a website. I mean, there's a lot that you can do on your own. And I don't know if there really is a, a great school to learn some of these things. And you know what else, Blaine, as you know, it's changing so darn fast. I mean, what you were good at last month with Facebook now is, you know, not great because you want to do TikTok or you want to do something right. else. I mean, it really is moving quickly. You know, but your story is so cool though, because it seems even listening to your career that you've been into like 73 different things, you know, almost simultaneously. Um, and it Probably. just kind of evolves, you know. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. You know, the world throws you curveballs and you kind of roll with it. I found a lot of joy in this, this surprising place with the knee business. But I'll tell you, when I was at Screen Vision or many of the other smaller companies where I was helping to build a business, there was a tremendous joy. Success, right? When you sell something or you put something together that people want to buy or like to listen to, there's great joy. I mean, the joy of my life right now, besides children and family and wife and stuff like that, is is the radio. And I don't think that'll ever leave. I, the, the joy of putting together this this thing every week is just fills me right now. But yet when I help a client, I've helped so many clients in the last year go from nothing, no presence on the internet to having a presence, to making money, to uh, building a real important business, very short periods of time because of a great website, because of good digital marketing because of the right kind of Facebook presence and all the things that we all know so well, but you have to put them together correctly and you've got to do them so that you look fully established. And I've been doing that for a lot of people and it's been very gratifying for me and for them because, you know, we're partners. I'm partners with all of the folks with whom I work right now. I talk about that a little bit. We have a mutual friend. We won't necessarily mention him by name, mm. but that as you, you indicated, aside from the radio show, aside from podcast, all the other things you're doing, you now are working with lots of other folks mm. in terms of helping them succeed. Yeah. And so what would you call that part of your business? Or you're, you're I guess, a digital marketing expert? Or yeah. Just I, mean, a, I guess it's, you know, it's funny because, you know, you start to go into these networking groups and I'm the SEO guy. Well, right. I'm, I do branding and I do logos and I do websites and I do the artwork and and you know what? The, the clients that I like the best that are the ones that need all of those things. They need a logo. They need to start from scratch. They don't want to spend a lot of money. So I'm not expensive. And, but I'm very, I'm very choosy. I'm very, I pick and choose the clients very carefully because I don't want to, um, you know, take on too much before, that I, you know, I, I can't do everything. And I also want to care uh, enough about what they're doing that, that we're going to, cause we're going to be working together for a long time. Oftentimes it turns into a retainer if they need it, or I'll just teach them. Uh, and sometimes I just teach them how to do it themselves so they can say goodbye to PJ and just do it themselves. But these are really uh, smaller businesses. And those are the ones that where I can really have a big impact 
Um, and that's, that's the joy. And so I guess you'd call it in a, in a sense, digital marketing, but we are really, we would become partners. We talk strategy. We talk about pricing. We talk about how to effectively communicate the pricing, you know, you know, and the, the, what they're trying to do and they're offering on the website. And I'll, I'll, I'll not a, not a pitch for my services at all. There are so many brilliant web developers out there. You just want to find somebody that you really like, that you can really trust, because it is the most important thing you will do for your business. The most important thing. I'm assuming you've got your act together. You're a lawyer, you're a coach, you're a, you've got a product. What? Okay, fine. But the thing that's going to matter forever is going to be the website and how you communicate through the website and the other outlets what um, what you do. The website's something you own. You don't own Facebook. You don't own that YouTube stuff. You don't. You own your content, but those are outlets where they're they're renting your content. They're they're selling your the eyeballs. We all know. We've all seen the social dilemma, and you know we we, we get it right. But but you own your URL. You own your website. That's something that you can throw energy into. And the more visitors that come to your front door and walk up your stairs and visit you and your website in your home on the internet, that's where you ha you can control the communication, share an experience, get them to like you. All that can be done digitally without you having it. You could be sleeping while all of this is going on with X10. I'm sleeping at three in the morning <laughs> and people are busily looking at our website, figuring out, oh, this is a good company. This is a product I need. I need to reach out to them right now. And suddenly there's a warm relationship coming in on in the next morning that some of us are going to respond to and and re and back up that warm feeling that the person had from the website, from the videos, from the testimonials, from the communication that we've been putting out. And now there's business that can be tra transacted and there are people that can be helped with knees or with what other clients are doing. So uh, it's it's crucially important and you don't need PJ. Don't hire me, but hire, hire somebody that's really believes in what you do, who isn't crazy expensive, who's, who isn't going to hit you up for those those fees, that surprising fees. You want to you really shop a lot before you pick a web developer or a digital marketer. And what's interesting about you, PJ, and you're a good example of what you said earlier, is that people find you, but mm -hmm. I assume in terms of all these clients you mentioned, you're not advertising extensively to get them. I have a good website um, and, you know, that should hopefully do what I was saying from, for me. I'm not, I'm not, you know, you'll see a lot of people, Blaine, out there beating the bushes, really pounding the pavement for, for clients. I'm not doing that. Uh, I am uh, enjoying working with the people that I am when I have a new one and bring them in. We do great work, whether we send them off or work to, with them on an ongoing basis. I, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not trying to build a big firm, you know, like a lot of people, I want to hire a whole staff and we're going to make this. Nah, I'm not trying to do that. I really love the one by one projects to help somebody make a meaningful difference. And, you know, you look at knee surgery or you look at somebody's website or communication. I want to make a difference in their lives. And if it turns into something a longer engagement, great. If it turns into a short you know, engagement, that's fine with me. But, but I know that I, what I know, just like you're helping so many people communicate with your show, what they're all about. I know I can help people communicate what they want to, to become successful. That's kind of my gift, I think. And so I, I'm careful how I use my gifts, but I, I do enjoy it a lot, really. Out of all the things you do, do you have a favorite thing? Yes, the radio station. The Is radio it really? Show. Oh my God. That's so uh, cool. Uh, Blaine, it's, it's, an obsession. It's so much fun. The, you know, it's almost like all these years, I'm 56, all these years I've wanted to, be, I, I've shared playlists and mixtapes <laughs> and you know, you know how you do. And if you love something, you want to, Hey, listen to this. I've been doing that all my life. And now I have a platform. I can, I can be PJ DJ, you know, and, 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 and share music and share other people's music and help careers and listen to their playlists. And Oh dear Lord. It's the most fun thing in the world. And it's it's you and, and the board and Daveen and this wonderful WPVM that's really made that a, a possibility. PJ, if folks want to get in touch with you to find out more about podcasts or about all the other cool stuff you're doing, what's the best bet? I want them to call you, Blaine. <laughs> Aside from that, how do they reach okay. you directly? Um, I, you can reach me. Well, if for the radio, the uh, the website is lesterthenightfly.com. And I'd love for you to come there and listen and visit and enjoy. And then the uh, the website is chiefmarketingoutsource.com. Just like it sounds. Lots of words, lots of letters. 
but uh, it's uh, CMO is kind of the, the overall arching idea, but it's chiefmarketingoutsource.com. Okay, and I'd like to thank you, PJ, uh, you and for being my guest the second half hour on the Blainswell Show. I'd also like to thank Franklin Keel for being my guest the first half hour, as well as Amy Prisnash, my producer. I look forward to seeing you here next Wednesday at 9 a.m. here on WPVM 103.7 Asheville, North Carolina. You can also listen online at WPVMFM.org and watch on WPVM's Facebook page. And PJ, if I can ask you a favor, we're going to sign off. Now, I just want to have you stay for a minute or two. I'd just like to wrap up with you if we can. Great. So again, as always, a pleasure, real pleasure to actually speak to you live or Me somewhat too. live on, on the air here and look forward to maybe even sometime having come to Asheville. What do you think about that? Man, I can't wait. This fall, I'll be there for sure. Okay, look forward to it. Okay, so stay on. I'm going to okay. sign off to the show.